The acclaimed and prolific architect Robert A.M. Stern has delivered a new memoir called Between Memory and Invention, My Journey in Architecture, co-written by Leopoldo Velarde and published by Monicelli in collaboration with the author's firm, Robert A.M. Stern Architects. Mr. Stern joins us today to discuss his life and work over more than 40 years, for well, over more than 50 years, I beg your pardon. Robert, how are you? I'm good, thank you. And Leopoldo, uh, thanks for joining us. Robert, your name is on the cover of 25 books. Some are more autographical than others. Uh, and now you come out with a new memoir. What was your motivation for writing it? And what can readers, both the uninitiated and familiar with your life in Udra, expect to find that's new even, and even surprising? Well, many of my books have been, uh, 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 the purpose of them has been to document the work of my work and the work of my office, my partners and everyone else involved. So they are, um, uh, they are by no means autobiographical, although you might uh, look through all of them and come up with a sense of the evolution of my professional life. Others of my books have been about um, one of my passions, which is the history of architecture and urbanism in the city of New York. So um, that covers another area of my career and interests. Um, then there are some uh, books that sort of document special uh, events, uh, interests, particularly finishing the two new residential colleges at Yale University, which was a great labor of love for me. So when you get all those out of the way, you come down to a bare nugget of stuff that could be called autobiographical. And I thought that, um, uh, and actually I was persuaded to do this by um, a, a young uh, architect in the office um, who said um, uh, uh, he would like to record me with the eye to writing an autobiography. Um, he's no longer in our office, but he left the recordings and, the, um, and they were all transcribed and Leopoldo took over at that point. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, as you mentioned, you're a native New Yorker, born in Brooklyn. Uh, yeah. share, share with us how your deep connection with the city has been an abiding influence on you professionally and personally. Well, uh, I, I, Brooklyn has always been in my mind a place to not be, a, a good place to be from, but not to stay in. <laughs> now, um, in, in my growing up days, which is a long time ago now, People were leaving Brooklyn uh, for the suburbs in particular. The city was changing. Uh, people were stuffed into apartments uh, that were too small for the number of uh, family members. That was the result of not only the depression before it, but the Second World War, which created vast shortages. Um, so now my attitude to Brooklyn, maybe I don't make it so clear as I should, have in the autobiography um, is rather more positive. Brooklyn, um, uh, as uh, its neighborhoods have been, have rebounded, not only the neighborhoods downtown, Barham Hill, for example, or Cobble Hill or whatever, but those out in, in Flatbush, um, like Windsor Terrace or Midwood or whatever. So um, I don't know what I would think of if I was a 15 year old growing up in Brooklyn today, but in those days, uh, in the 1940s and 50s, I wanted out. Mm -hmm. And I got out. <laughs> um, when I was thinking about talking with you, uh, what came to mind, oddly enough, was a film documentary called 50, 20 Feet from Stardom, in which Bruce Springsteen makes the point about how it's a long walk between backup singer and going to the front of the stage. Is that something that you can relate to when you were starting your own firm in the 1970s? Uh, absolutely. Uh, getting started as an architect is a, is a tough uh, uh, um, uh, road to hoe, as you might say. But I've been, I had uh, uh, the support of a couple of key mentors the architectural historian, Vincent Scully, the um, architect and chairman of the Department of Architecture at Yale while I was a student, Paul Rudolph, and most notably, I suppose, Philip Johnson, who through his long uh, career 
once we got to know each other, was all, all often supportive of my efforts and knew when to pick up the phone and make connections for me. Um, so he was a very valuable help. Um, uh, other people, family, whatever, are too numerous to mention, but they do count seriously in support. And mostly my parents, uh, who had no idea what an architect uh, was in a certain way, um, and certainly didn't think I should be an architect. They thought maybe a doctor or a lawyer, um, uh, the typical um, 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 middle-class careers for uh, uh, people in my generation. Um, uh, but uh, they, they always said, if that's what you want to do, do it. And so that was very important to me. Does the, me does the memoir shed any new light on your influences? Well, I, depends, I think a little bit depends on who's reading it. Um, yeah. A few architects uh, who knew me from way back uh, at Yale or even Columbia, where I was an undergraduate, probably will be smiling at my version of what they remember. But, um, uh, but for the uh, other readers, whomever they might be, I think it's new territory, whether they're interested in it or not, is a whole other story. I mean, everybody these days, maybe every day, writes his own or her own autobiography. The pages of the book reviews are filled with autobiography, <laughs> biography titles. So, uh, but I love to read autobiographies. I love to read biographies. Um, I uh, increasingly don't read much fiction. I make certain exceptions, but, but I, I love to read what people thought about their lives and, um, and, what, and what historians or critics taking up the subject of people's lives uh, make of them. Mm -hmm. Robert, your memoir places your career within the context of two aesthetic movements, postmodernism and modern traditionalism, and the evolution from one to the other. How did you arrive at that artistic inference and how has it affected your design since? Well, I, I don't want to disagree with you, but it's not, it's important to also note that I was educated in modernist architecture. That was what the standard of the 1950s in architecture schools such as Yale was where many of the faculty had graduated from the Harvard Graduate School of Design, studied under Walter Gropius, and a kind of American version of the Bauhaus. But then um, I and a, a few others, and then more and more, began to rebel against the self-imposed limitations of that point of view. And so something emerged called postmodernism, which argued that in order to go forward, you needed to go backward, that architecture was not such a narrow window on its own history as the modernists argued, but that it was something that could open up um, uh, to the architecture before. And for the first time in the history of architecture that I'm aware of, modernism, stylistic modernism, rejected the past out of court. And that seemed very wrong to me. So the postmodern phase, which flourished, maybe reached a high point in 1980 with the Biennale in Venice, devoted to postmodernism in Biennale, uh, archi the first architecture Biennale ever, um, then began as all movements to wear down its moment, lose its momentum and also to become in its own way, way ossified, starts as a revolution, but doesn't always remain as such. And then um, I began to see that what my personal interests were, and of course I'd like to have other people join me in those interests was to take the traditional architecture of the past. Classical architecture is the high uh, game of architectures as the English architects Sir Edmund Lutchen said, and vernacular architecture as I'd been in, uh, introduced to it at a very interesting way by Vincent Scully and his lectures on American domestic architecture of the 19th and early 20th century. See if I could cobbled together those two points of view into a new synthesis, which I gave the name um, a modern uh, traditionalism, of which I gave, yes, it, a name, modern traditionalism. And so whenever we take a new project on, 
in, in my office, my, I and my partners, um, we always begin by looking for precedents in the past um, and um, put, anchor our feet in the past in order to go forward. We do not begin our work by just looking at what's in the magazines today, um, uh, uh, um, so-called magazine modern. Um, we want a deeper, richer connection to what went before. And I think it's been very uh, beneficial to my work as an architect and maybe to architecture as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, your design career has been quite varied, moving from private homes to projects with Disney, to tall condo buildings. Are the detectable design signatures that link these works and to what extent do they reflect your personal life, if at all? Well, the um, houses, the houses which have been the bedrock of our practice since um, 1965, when I exited from architecture school, have strong connections to the, the American shingle style for which I was, to which I was introduced in a systematic way by Vincent Scully and his great lectures at Yale and in his book, The Shingle Style, um, published in 1955, the first time, and it's been reissued many times since. Um, so uh, um, adding to that, because the shingle style tends to have a New England seaside origin, shall we say, um, but uh, that led me to other uh, domestic languages, uh, vernaculars, uh, classicism, um, American classicism, English, uh, and on and on. But then when I uh, um, was given the opportunity, the privilege of designing bigger buildings, that is taller buildings or more monumental buildings, I had to face the fact and I welcomed the fact that I could expand my vocabulary so that, you know, buildings like the American Revolution Museum, which we finished a few years ago in Philadelphia, takes as its jumping off point stylistically. Um, the the mm -hmm. uh, early, late Georgian, early uh, federal architecture uh, of Independence Hall, Carpenters Hall, and that whole environs. Um, uh, at the same time, um, nearer to the, cent the commercial center of Philadelphia, we were finishing Comcast Center, which is a 900 plus foot tall office building, all sheathed in glass, which refers to what um, uh, people think I'm against, which is glass buildings, hmm. but that's not true. I'm not against them. I'm just against them maybe for um, uh, residential purposes. I think they are, uh, they are not the kind of environment that is best suited to sheltering uh, people in their um, uh, apartments. Mm -hmm. How about the work with Disney? Is there is there any link to um, your the kind of residential work to, that you could cite? Um, yes, when I was um, uh, early on, um, I was at a meeting and um, we've been asked to take a look at one of the new hotels that Disney was embarked upon in Orlando and another architect was working on a, a, a twin to it, shall we say, or a companion building. And that architect um, was not doing so well in his presentation. And Michael Eisner espied on the, uh, uh, on the presentation board that that architect had a picture of a, a house that we had done, the Lawson house on, um, in Quag on Long Island. And um, that set a light bulb off to Michael. He thought I could expand on those um, uh, shingled uh, images and, and convert them to big hotels, which I did with the uh, uh, boardwalk and, and others in Orlando. So um, these things happen. Um, uh, if you're an architect who's just got horse blinders on you <laughs> and, uh, and you just want to go one way, okay, that's fine, you do what you want to do. And there are a lot of architects who do that, who, um, Mies van der Rohe um, was a kind of magnificent Johnny One Note. Um, but uh, I'm not that way, I'm basically an eclectic in the sense that I like to look at different things from different periods and make new um, appropriate, I hope, syntheses. Mm -hmm. 
Now, your career has also toggled between business and academia. Um, how, to what extent does your book touch on some of your memories of your tenure at, as the uh, dean of Yale Law School out of architecture? Dean of yeah. architecture school, not law school. Uh, did I say law? I beg your pardon. <laughs> uh, um, well, to begin with, I taught at Columbia in the architecture school for a very long time before going back to Yale in the capacity of dean. Um, so I've always had a foot in academia. And that's not so unusual for architects or even some lawyers who give courses in various law schools while uh, occupying important positions um, in their respective professions. Um, so uh, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy um, shaking the, uh, the tree of learning, shall we say, <laughs> uh, and uh, 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 riling people up a bit. Uh, I like to rile my co colleagues up in architecture school because they tend to get a bit sedentary in their point of view. Um, but mostly I like to rile students up who come to school to study architecture often with no pre-existing uh, experience of the discipline, but already a pre-set idea of what modern architecture is. And I've devoted my uh, time as a teacher um, to telling them that it is not one thing. It's a, it, it can be many, many things, um, which is very different from when I was a student, when we were told, me and my classmates, um, that basically modern architecture had been defined and it was what it was. And uh, everything that went before was, as I said earlier, was um, out the door. So I hope I'm answering your question. Maybe you not. you are, but I'm wondering uh, if you might be able to elaborate on whether or not you believe that architecture school is adequately preparing students for careers. Um, there's been some debate about that uh, that's been ongoing, but uh, and you could say that about any profession as well. But what is the the, the value of architecture? Is it meeting the uh, meeting the expectations? Well, that's a complicated question because one definition of meeting expectations would be um, uh, an issue of professional competence and states like, well, the US states um, uh, exam, arch examine architects for some reasonable measure of competence. And that reflects the need for architecture uh, uh, students to go to school um, where they're introduced to all kinds of technical subjects, not to master them, I would say, but to be familiar with them and where they also then are, 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 have to apprentice in some kind of professional situation. On the other hand, the great architecture schools, which are not so many, um, emphasize design. Now the question is, do they emphasize the design, the look, the, the compositional structure of buildings at the expense of professionalism? Uh, they often do, and you'll hear critics and teachers saying, oh, well, don't worry about that. He'll figure that out, meaning the student, um, later on. Well, I think it shouldn't be put on a back burner. I think a really good education combines them. But in a, in a school like Yale, which is a design school par excellence, um, uh, at least when I was dean, and I think it goes on now, and I think it went on before me, there is a considerable healthy emphasis on structures, um, on what's going on in the world, but it's a graduate program, which is not so common in architecture and which students have been in liberal arts colleges and have been introduced to foreign languages and philosophies and history and so forth. So they come to graduate to study architecture as a discipline with a kind of uh, a solid base. That's not true of every architect, but I don't want to sound like a grumpy old dean, <laughs> which I might be. <laughs> Let's bring uh, Leopoldo into the conversation and talk a little bit about the process that both of you went through to assemble and write this memoir. Um, so yes, I, I mean, I'm trained as an architect and as an architectural historian from undergrad to graduate school, and it's been a privilege and an honor to work with Bob um, on his autobiography over the course of the last couple of years. I was really there to keep 
Bob focused, as it were, <laughs> um, and to dig through his papers and archives. Many have noted that, you know, Bob has a, a memory that is like a steel trap, but every once in a while we need to refresh it with documents and drawings and, you know, over the course of the, the last couple of years, parallel to writing, Bob has been reviewing phone logs, appointment books, drawing sets, photographs, slides. So there really is, I think, in comparison to other autobiographies or biographies for that matter, that might not have the same kind of um, uh, research-based or historical underpinning, um, that was certainly there and it was intentional um, to match Bob's you know, long career as a historian and an educator. Robert, in terms of the actual writing of the book, um, uh, what, how did it, how did that take place? I mean, was it, uh, did you write a draft, have it reviewed by Leopold in terms of checking facts? And then uh, maybe you can shed some light on that, that aspect. Well, as I think I said at the beginning of our talk together, um, I did do some recordings of uh, recollections oh, and, right. and, and which uh, um, uh, Patrick, um, Oh, no, I'm having a senior moment, forgetting Corrigan. his last name. What? Patrick Corrigan. Patrick Corrigan, um, a young architect uh, graduate um, who, who had helped Paul Goldberger on a book about Frank Gehry. So he knew oh, okay. the, his way around this territory. But uh, Patrick would come and sit with me for a half hour or an hour, one or two days a week and ask me questions. Um, and then they get typed up. Uh, but then um, uh, Pat, when the um, uh, uh, pandemic set in, Patrick moved on to, um, um, uh, uh, we had to narrow down the number of people in the office and regrettably Patrick had to move on. Um, uh, and um, uh, then Leopoldo was there already and I asked him if he would help. He was already helping with this project. But having a lot of free time during the um, pandemic, particularly I say the first year, um, uh, the I would continue to talk into the tape recorder, and then and I get these printed out copies. I get I like to have the type everything typed out with very wide spaces between each line, double double space. So in the middle, I can write <laughs> another version or correct. And also I'd been, for years, been working um, with our archivist, uh, Tim Reddy, to deposit my papers, professional and personal papers at Yale in the, um, uh, in, the in Sterling Library. So I, we had those to go back to, and we're still depositing papers there. We got kind of stymied in that process by the fact that the university shut down for quite a while. Yeah. So that's how it was. It's an iterative process. Um, I keep thinking of other things I could have put in the book. Um, I'm not mad enough to think that I will write in another volume. Uh, people who write a second volume of their autobiography typically stumble on the second one. It's not nearly as interesting as the first. Of course, mm. I, it is not yet clear whether the world thinks these this book is interesting. A few of my friends have said it is, so I'll take their word for it. And if you've heard rumors that Bob is a workaholic, I will confirm those to be true. You know, Bob, during the course of the week, will be meeting with project teams constantly to review designs. Much of the work for the autobiography occurred over the weekend. I would often supply materials on Friday, and Bob would work tirelessly over Saturday and Sunday to redeliver a very large stack of notes to me first thing on Monday. <laughs> Robert, you turn 83 in May, and, you, you're showing, and, and you're showing no signs of slowing down. What's your next chapter? Well, um, we're still, I, I'm still reluctant to go into the office on a regular basis. I'm still terrified of this virus when, when you're old and, as I am. But um, my next chapter will be and I hope a continuation of the old chapter of being in the office rather than doing a lot of work on Zoom. But also I have another series of books, as I mentioned early in this conversation, 
on New York, working with two co-authors, uh, David Fishman and Jacob Tyloff. And um, uh, uh, th that series began in eight, 1981, and um, it has grown to five volumes. And when the fifth one was finished, I said, enough. I'm not going to do any more. Um, it, it fitted on my bookshelf in a certain way, and there's no more room for another one in that series. But so many interesting things happened after 2000, both positive, the city was in a great place um, from a point of view of architecture and urbanism, and then a disastrous place from the point of view of uh, public life, and we are still in that disastrous place. So I've been working on a book called New York 2020, which succeeds its predecessor, New York 2000. And uh, we've written, um, Jake, David, and I, a whole lot of text, um, and it's in pretty good shape. And Leo Poldo is now helping them put together the photos uh, for to illustrate the text. And maybe by the end of this year, um, it will go to the publisher for editing and so forth. But it, I said I'd never do it, and I've done it. After that, I have no idea what I'll do next. But I'll tell you one thing. I will not be playing golf at the Masters. <laughs> Gentlemen, thanks for spending the time to talk a little bit about the memoir. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and to meet you. And I hope this has been useful. Yeah. Thank you, John. Uh, this is John Caulfield from Building Design and Construction Magazine. Thanks to our audience for joining us.